at NASA for right at 30 years. Um, the only thing I've done longer than that is I've been a modeler for close to 45. I think I started when I was eight. And there's a fair amount of modeling that is rolled into this presentation because we are using RC models, uh, remotely piloted techniques and so forth to do the engineering analysis and assessment of the concept. Since the early days of space flight, a goal has been to basically create a system that allows you to operate from runways more like aircraft than vertical launch rockets. And the reason why is launching from a ground-based pad it has a lot of overhead. It's expensive, it's a serial process. Uh, typically they'll have a pad uh, for each one of the different designs of rockets because they're very customized. The problem is if they have a technical problem, which is often with these rockets, you've seen shuttle slip and things like that, then your schedule slipped the same amount, if not more, because then maybe the one in front of you slips a little bit. Uh, as expensive as the rockets are, the staffing and the labor of your contractor team and your engineering support team is more than the cost of the rocket on average, because of all the intense planning and so forth to go into it. So I'd like to get away from being stuck with the vertical launch system uh, approach and go to more of how aircraft ops are. If, if it costs a lot more, people won't do it just because it's neat, you know, or it's cool. They do it because it's a better way to operate, and, and that really translates down to dollars. In aerospace, nothing comes for free. Everything is a big trade-off. We're going to talk about the airplanes and how we're using RC airplanes and test techniques to uh, more cost-effectively and quicker get to an answer that we think will basically determine whether this is viable or not. Uh, NASA Dryden, since the late 50s uh, until I think it was retired in 2006, had a B-52, uh, tail number 008, that's now retired from service. It launched on the X-15 program, 199 suborbital flights. So the X-15 went to uh, Mach 6.79 with Pete Knight on board and in excess of 400,000 feet altitude. Anything over uh, 50,000 feet in altitude, um, or I'm sorry, 250,000 feet, 50 nautical miles is considered space. Um, it also launched hundreds of other atmospheric research flight tests. All of the lifting bodies were launched off of the B-52. We also carried the solid rocket boosters um, for the space shuttle and tested the parachute recovery system that allowed those to be recovered and refurbished for use on the shuttle. Uh, and then we also did four Pegasus development launches. Um, four of those went to orbit. What you've got here is the X-15 and then this is the Pegasus. Uh, they're remarkably, size, remarkably similar in size, wingspan length. There's a reason why um, the X-15, when it was designed and built, was built for the B-52. The wingspan was basically two feet shorter than how much room you had between the number five engine and the side of the fuselage. When Orbital came along and, and came up with doing the uh, Pegasus, they designed it to basically the, the same wingspan, the same load limits of the hooks on the vehicle on the B-52. And then when they transitioned that to their L-1011 and started doing commercial launches for profit with that, um, basically they carry it re slightly recessed into the belly of the airplane. Pegasus is, um, I think it's 51 feet long, 50 inch diameter. They have eight inches of ground clearance. And if they get a flat tire or collapse a strut, that goes to an inch in a hurry. Not a lot of real estate, and that, that'll be a theme that you'll hear will come back. But basically, it's a 50,000-pound launch capability still in use today based up in Mojave. Ten years ago, uh, Scaled Composites in pursuit of the X Prize developed the White Knight to launch Spaceship One, which was retired in 2004. There's a picture of it here. They flew only three suborbital flights at the edge of space. Quite different profile than the X-15, not anywhere near the thermal heating, not anywhere near the velocities. They basically went straight up and almost straight back down whereas the X-15 went downrange on the order of 400 miles. Quite a bit different profile, um, but nonetheless notable for what they were doing. Also back in 97, 98 at Dryden under a uh, CIBR, which is a small business innovative research grant with uh, Kelly Space and Technology, we did a demonstration for them where we towed an F-106 behind an Air Force C-141. Here's a flight photo of the 106 here. You can see the tow line and the 141. It was a 1,500 foot long tow rope. Tow forces were on the order of about 14,000 pounds on average. Uh, turns out in this, an early look at the math, if you take the lift to drag ratio of the airplane that you're towing and divide the weight of the vehicle by that, that is your tow force because that's the drag. And so the airplane uh, is on the order of 26, 25,000 pounds, um, but you're not always flying at optimal lift to drag ratio. The L over D on that airplane is on the order of 11 or 12, 
but there are times on the flight where it's four or five. Uh, it's a Delta Wing airplane. This was piloted. Uh, Mark Stuckey, um, call sign Forger, who now flies at Scaled Composites, was the pilot for it. Um, they, they nicknamed the, the uh, project Dope on a Rope. Uh, he didn't care for that so much. Uh, but uh, what, what did come out of that was how easy it was to fly the, the, the 106 behind the tow plane. He could literally go hands off most of the time as long as he positioned the airplane properly behind the wake of the 141. So at about the same time, um, back in 97, I was asked to lead by our center director to lead a group to look at replacing our B-52 because it was so old and so difficult to maintain and support. Uh, it was just an old airplane. The airplane was built in 1952. So the 008 means it was the eighth B-52 built. And there just weren't any parts. And so uh, I put together a team with some notable people on it. Dale Reed, who at Dryden was one of the fathers of the lifting body that involved into the shuttle. All of the lifting body programs, M2F1, M2F2, HL10, all the X24A and B were all Dale Reed run programs. Dale was on my project team. Bill Albrecht, who was the... Uh, flight ops engineer on the B-52, I believe, for every single X-15 launch. Joe Misplay, who was one of the crew chiefs on one of the X-15s. I had a great team. And we went through and looked at some 50 different airplanes to replace the B-52 with. And the real problem you run into is it's real estate. And I'll get into some of the pros and cons of that in a minute and, and what that really means. But as we finished up our study, we had recommended that a C-5 would be a good replacement airplane. We thought one might be available. It's a big airplane. Main reason for picking it was it was in the U.S. inventory. It was still, it's still being flown today by the Air Force, and there's quite a bit of room between the number three engine and the side of the fuselage, more than on a B-52. So that was the main reason for that. About the same time we finished doing the 106 tow test, Bob Meyer, who was chief engineer at, the Dryden, at Dryden at the time, asked us to take a quick look at direct tow using the C-5. So Dale, being the crafty engineer that he was, figured out a way to back engineer out what the specific excess thrust available at altitude of a C-5 would be. It took me about a month to figure out how he put together this chart, because well, the data wasn't really available. But basically what this shows is a C-5 with a notional vehicle in tow, not unlike the, one, um, the uh, 106 that we towed. Basically, the premise is, is that they were going to, instead of trying to carry the rocket booster underneath the airplane where there's not a lot of room, they were going to directly tow it behind the airplane. The problem with that is, is hypersonic vehicles, and in their approach, you would cut away the line and then light off the rocket motor, and the whole airplane flies to altitude and then releases the next stage and off you go. The problem is that their hypersonic shapes have very poor lift-to-drag ratios. They're more of a dart shape than they are a sailplane. So where sailplanes are up in the 30, 40, 50, even 70 range on the very exotic sailplanes, and uh, a C5 is, I think the L over D is on the order of about 15 or 16, the L over D on this is going to be typically about three or four. And, the, and therein lies the problem. So if you look at the C5, if you have a, and let's just say you're trying to launch a 300,000 pound vehicle, which is a pretty good sized rocket. Okay, it's bigger than what's being done. Pegasus is 50,000 pounds. But at 300,000 pounds, to get to 30 or 20, I'm sorry, 30,000 feet in altitude, you'd have to have an L over D of 20. Because the plot is the lift to drag ratio of this vehicle, rocket included, and the weight of this vehicle. So you can pick out the weight you want to do. And basically what happens is to get to that altitude, you've got to have a pretty good L over D. Well, if you look at the L over D at that weight of maybe four, you can't get off the ground at 300,000 pounds. You don't have enough excess thrust available on a C-5. Now, if you go smaller, you know, down in the 20, 30,000 pound range, you know, and you have an L over D of four, well, you could get to 40,000 feet. You're just brute forcing it, you know. And basically, th th this is a boat anchor, but that's not a lot of weight. A C-5 will carry 300,000 pounds internal. So it's just a very inefficient way of doing things. And at that point, we kind of stopped and went on our merry way. And, but I'd been thinking about this for a while and uh, hadn't really done much with the idea until about two years ago, 